Welcome to Cliff's Wujo. A dojo is a place in which the martial arts are practiced. A wujo is a place in which the woo arts are practiced. The woo arts are all things officially denied and everything unknown. It's uh, July 23rd, 2.54 p.m. Uh, Pacific Northwest, uh, North America. I don't think the woo is going to get any uh, deeper than we're at right at the moment. We're approaching the December uh, Mayan calendar end date. At the same time, we're approaching the December focus or focal point for the powers that be. A lot of their stuff is is focused on just keeping it together until December. Uh, The reason that I'm doing this talk today is to... I'll tell you this right up front. At the end of this, I'm going to suggest that you spend some money in a couple of specific places. I'll tell you why then, too. But the reason I'm doing the talk today is to discuss uh, the Farsight.org, their 2012 uh, remote viewing experiments, and the um, uh, confirmatory experiments that I've uh, participated in, both remote viewing... um, and other, and then uh, examination of our own data relative to this. And basically, here's what it comes down to. The um, Farsight.org fellow, Courtney Brown, um, in spite of being an academic, uh, in spite of having a PhD, uh, is a real smart fellow, and has come up with a brilliant experiment that uh, validates remote viewing, and we'll know for sure by June 1 of 2013. In the process of doing this uh, experiment, he came across, uh, he inadvertently designed it in such a way that universe provided us with a view of what's going to happen next year. This view coincides with um, our understanding of what is motivating the powers that be in all their weird-ass activity. Everything from the deep underground bases, the strange um, uh, media act activities, the currency problems, the financial crisis, everything, all of the activity of the powers that be is focused on getting through this year, and it's focused on on that alone. They, uh, we see this from the way in which the um, whole um, cabal, the cabal, the um, uh, powers that be the, that run everything from, you know, the Vatican and the Queen and all of these people, uh, they're all focused on just this short term. Uh, There's no intention, for instance, of paying back any debt uh, ever. Uh, They just want you to believe that they might pay it back someday on the other side of June next year. Now, I'm just using June as an example. They probably don't have it picked that way. Anyway, farsight.org. Go to their site. uh, Look at these material for 2012 and read it. Uh, Here's one of the suggestions. Uh, Look at um, Courtney Brown's interviews uh, with Red Ice and with uh, Kerry Cassidy, uh, Project Camelot. Listen to these. Listen to him lay out the details. Go and look at these details yourself. Uh, See how uh, they lay out in your mind. And then uh, here's the new information. I have uh, participated in um, an experiment that validates um, many of the components of what they've seen. I've also uh, done my own control experiment, and so I've worked with the Hawaiian Remote Viewers Guild guys and then another group in Europe that validated them. So we have a validation of a validation. And uh, these have raised in my mind the uh, this and all the weird activity of the powers that be. I mean, that's the real uh, kicker in the whole thing here is that it's validated it in my mind to the point that I'm really certain that the remote viewers had picked up on something that Courtney Brown's experiment provides a very good descriptor. And so um, this also lines up with our global coastal event. Our global coastal event, we had supposed, I'd been writing about it since 2003, wrote about it extensively in the early, up to like 2006 or so, and the data just kind of trailed off. It never really materialized. I thought, oh, well, you know, it was a failed interpretation. Problem was, it wasn't that. What was, was seeing the early indications of the global coastal event, which was still pending and which will occur over these next couple of years. It won't be a single-shot thing, probably. If the remote viewer's information is accurate, this is going to be probably like a three-wave deal. Um, It may be meteors or asteroids, whatever. Um, 
the uh, fireball component will maybe impact and cause the global coastal uh, symptoms that we have to deal with. So here's where we are. I don't know what causes the global coastal event. Don't have a I have a surety, don't have a certainty on that at all. Uh, the data that I had in my global coastal event never really went so far as to say what the cause was. However, uh, the data within that global coastal event produced the subset of data with which I was able to forecast the Sumatran tsunami uh, some eight and nine months in advance. It uh, produced the data set that also forecast the Scott Peterson trial being uh, emptied out of their courthouse due to an earthquake. So that was a very accurate data set. Um, that data set uh, for the global coastal event uh, had that as a subset, the Sumatran tsunami. And our forecast on that was pretty accurate. So that being the case, the global coastal events, other descriptors are likely also as accurate likely also as accurate, and if not as accurate as the m stuff that's already m manifested, because the future can change, then they have a tendency to be um, more accurate towards the extent that that data set manifested. Okay, so uh, our global coastal event um, is not described by the Farsight.org guys, but their experiment and their results would be individual subsets within our global coastal event. So it, it snugs right into what we had described years and years and years ago, independent of their research using an entirely different method. Absolutely uh, the difference between bricks and oranges. You know, you can't get any more different. And yet we come up with the same conclusions. And then we also can validate against the weird-ass movements of the powers that be. Therefore, this all gives credence to the idea that the global coastal event descriptor is probably as an accurate a way to look at things as uh, the Farsight.org descriptor. But Farsight.org has their entire experiment available for you for free. You can buy a DVD and get it from them, which explains everything. Uh, you know, the, the overall view, the lecture that tells you what's happening. But the data sets are available. Our old data sets are also available circulating on the net, which describe the global coastal event. Uh, if you want, you can probably go to, like, the WebBot forum and ask around, and people could give you specific examples. Uh, I've collected in all my handwritten notes here on the global coastal event and have been compiling those. I may, if I get the opportunity, produce a synopsis um, of these uh, and, and post it or publish it. But it's not my goal. I'm not attempting to do that. Uh, simply because there's so little time. We have less than five months before all of these events uh, start manifesting. Further, as it, it's, not, it's not like the world's going to hold still until then. We're going to have the economic collapse. We're going to have the false flag stuff happen in um, uh, London. We're going to have the uh, Israelis attack the Iranians. Uh, you know, may even have the space aliens show up. That's a weird-ass, really a uh, woo-woo component of all of this. And let's take a little diversion there for a moment. As part of the validation for this, I have to say that I have become acquainted with a couple of guys that, for lack of a better word, have escaped from the Shadow World's uh, scientific cube farm, where they uh, raise scientists to build them weapons. These two guys uh, uh, have validated the Farsight.org's description of what's going to occur, again, as a subset of a greater mass of stuff. Now, the two guys that escaped from the Shadow World's cube farm have shared with me that uh, not only will we be dealing with these major Earth impacts from meteors, but they've also shared with me that that will be uh, that is only part of the powers that be's concern. The powers that be are very concerned with the uh, imminent or um, un unveiling, not arrival because they're here, but unveiling of uh, interdimensional beings or extraterrestrials, however you want to think about them, that we're going to have to interact with in the future. Uh, why? I guess we'll di discover over time. But so, so the uh, the cube farm escapees are validating a view that was uh, basically described by Sean David Morton in his book Sands of Time. Uh, he had supposedly been given the uh, deathbed um, uh, bequest of a, uh, a gift of a, uh, a person's life story who who lived and worked deep in the shadow world. And he had uh, fictionalized it and put it out as a novel called Sands of Time, uh, which you can get at, you know, SeanDavidMorton.com or whatever his website is. Um, uh, Strange Universe, that's it, StrangeUniverse.com. 
Anyway, uh, and it lays out all how the interdimensional aliens are slipping through these holes that are part of this uh, alignment with the black rift of the middle of this uh, middle of the Milky Way galaxy and uh, all the temporal issues involved with that. And that is a larger uh, woo-woo set that includes the global sub uh, coastal event as a subset of it. Uh, so uh, the Cube Farm guys are saying, basically, uh, yo, dude, it's not going to be just that you're going to be swimming and have to deal with earthquakes and no electricity and and uh, uh, massive amounts of ultraviolet light from the sun and all this other crud. Uh, oh, by the way, you're going to have these, you know, space alien bastards to screw around with too. <laughs> so anyway, we got we've got our um, we got our work cut out for us next year uh, in dealing with all of these uh, situations. Now. The reason for my taking the time out of my busy boat building schedule, uh, actually is I gotta give my hands a break. I've been sanding and uh, I'm just done with the main vodka, the main hull. And I've gotta finish the keel out, but I really need to let them uh, have a day without having to m- mess with machinery. And also I had a long talk, many hour talk with uh, Courtney Brown from farsight.org. Bounced a lot of ideas off each other. Uh, it's dangerous to get two bald guys together because you end up with something that looks like a plumber's butt crack. But um, sometimes you get a good idea or two out of them. And um, uh, I had a discussion with him, and it brought up this whole idea. And, you know, it really validated his work. Um, we're at that situation where, you know, uh, only uh, the willfully blind will not see that uh, shit ain't right and things need to be done. So uh, I want to suggest that if you've got the money, uh, uh, get a copy of uh, Sean David Morton's book if you want to look at the woo-woo side of things. If you've got the money, buy the farsight.org um, uh, DVD about their uh, various experiments. They're really quite fascinating. I can't wait to get to the rest of it. I'm just too busy. I've been focusing on the 2012. And then also, I wanted to discuss the general description that we get from our global coastal event, assuming it is a probability that includes the descriptors uh, that you can read over at the farsight.org of the various different cities and how they'll fare over this next um, almost a year. So uh, basically what I'm saying is that here we have a larger subset, the global coastal, or a larger set, the global coastal event, which is itself a subset of deep woo-woo, um, everything happening all at once, 2012, end of Mayan calendar, space aliens come on in. Now within our subset of the global coastal event, we have the individual subsets. You can read at farsight.org. I'm going to augment those descriptions, though, with a collection of just some of the language that I've been able to root out in my old notes, as well as some of the validating information from our recent confirmatory experiments. And so I'll talk about that for a second here. I worked with a couple of members of the Hawaiian Remote Viewers Guild. Uh, These guys are scary good. I mean, scary, scary good. Uh, I was never really into remote viewing because I really didn't understand uh, the technical stuff of keeping the ego and all the crap out of the way. Uh, But these guys have certainly mastered that. In terms of the details they provided with this confirmatory experiment, I had it designed in such a way that I would know that the I would know of its validity now. There would be elements within the description that would tell me that indeed these people were zeroing in on something that could uh, exist a year from now because parts of it existed now, if that makes sense. It's very much the way I treat my own data within my own data sets, where uh, as I was referencing the Sumatran tsunami descriptors that we got, we got just all kinds of descriptors. Um, nation kicked back to a previous age, 300,000 killed, uh, Stone Age appearance, uh, weddings disrupted, and on and on and on and on. All these descriptors that later on turned out to be fulfilled as the Sumatran tsunami manifested, including all the weddings disrupted. Now, this is key because those particular minutia of language showing up uh, uh, were of in essence, validating the the data set with which they were in by having a very high percentage of that data set data set show up as actual uh, manifested language. The Sumatran data set, I think uh, we were in the high 90s in terms of uh, percentage of the language actually materializing. Now, that subset was a part of the global coastal event subset. So there were, we had a lot of very good subsets, uh, uh, blondes on boats that we did in the most recent reports from last year that, again, were manifest in the boat 
fiasco off of Italy with the uh, cruise ship sinking and the blondes causing the problems and all of that. That subset, again, is part of the global coastal subset. So we get these amazingly high, highly accurate um, subsets showing up. And so I have a tendency to use those as validators for the larger global coastal event subset in my own mind. I'm not saying that it's 100% accurate, but I'm saying that this does give credence to it because those sets have appeared and they were early indicators of this larger manifestation. So what I did was to design my experiment with the Hawaii guys such that uh, I would get some early validators as to whether their view of... Uh, events uh, had any va- validity from this point forward. And indeed, they shocked me. Um, they The results of the remote viewing could not have been more damn precise uh, if we, you know, if it had been an open book test. <laughs> Uh, you know, if we'd actually transported them there and brought them back, it couldn't have been more precise because I have the the early indicators that are 100% on. Therefore, I'm going to say, okay, the remote viewing um, session, the experiment that we just did, I'm going to call it a good a confirmation of the uh, re- farsight.org's um, uh, data work for 2012, because that's specifically what we were after. I was not trying to validate my larger global coastal event subset. I was only trying to validate the remote viewing concept and the work of the farsight.org, and in my mind, both have passed. They're 100% skookum, and um, as we say up here, finest kind. You know, you just don't get any better. So, that being the case, let's look at, uh, I'm going to intermix some of these. Uh, some of the confirmatory experiment data is going to be intermixed with the global coastal event descriptors I'm reading you here because it's essentially validating just what I'd had in the way of language. So my global coastal event shows that the uh, infrastructure goes down. The lo- electricity infrastructure goes down. This will be, by the way, for all those people that survived this shit, here is a huge opportunity. When we rebuild, let us do just this. Let us take Buckminster Fuller's idea and build all of our uh, new, uh, if we need a transmission lines. We may not in the future because we may be building our power where we need it. But if we need, do need distribution lines, let's do it um, down the um, outlining all of the continents just somewhat inland and connect a, for a giant uh, planetary uh, electrical grid so everybody has really cheap electricity and redundancy. All right, so we're not going to have electricity as of June of next year. I won't be living with electricity uh, as of June of next year, we will have a situation where the global coastal event will be underway. The infrastructure will be failing or have failed in your in your area. Uh, there will be still spotty areas where electricity will persist beyond June. Uh, but the area I will be in, in Puget Sound, won't have it. Uh, likely most of the West Coast will be the same way. Uh, we will have the breakdown of the just-in-time food supply. We will have horrifically devastating uh, problems relative to structures. And this will come from both extremely bad weather and lots of nasty earthquakes. Not merely one or two, but a whole series of them as things readjust. It would seem as though whether it's a, a crack in the Pacific Plate like I'd originally thought... Uh, that just happens because of the expansion of the Earth, or whether the Earth is actually hit by something in the way of asteroids that causes a crack or doesn't cause a crack, it doesn't really matter. The net result seems to describe pretty much the same thing, and that is a, um, a situation where this time next year, June of next year, June, July of next year, we're dealing with a building destruction um, and horrific loss of life, uh, the breakdown of the infrastructure, the breakdown of, uh, for instance, uh, absolutely no sign of government, no sign of rescue, no hospitals that are operating, uh, nobody operating anywhere near 100% on anything, no um, gasoline, no delivery systems. Um, you know, uh, during the initial parts of it, after the first uh, rush of the earthquakes and the breakdowns, all kinds of crime and rioting to deal with as people uh, uh, go out of their mind due to the circumstances and also try doing looting under the very nasty circumstances when they should be fleeing for the hills. Um, uh, Also, we have really bad weather. As part of this uh, shock wave that uh, goes around the planet with a co- global coastal event, whether we want to think of it as climate change or weather or a one-off occurrence, it doesn't matter. There's horrific storms. 
there's um, um, inblown dust or volcanic kind of stuff. It's hard to say. Now, just because I labeled it the Global Coastal Event, do not assume that the inland areas in any way are better off. They are not. Whatever it is, that, and we don't know for certain whether it will be meteors, that's the uh, presumption at the moment, but we don't know for certain. But whatever it is causes such a huge amount of water to enter the atmosphere that uh, we get inland uh, flooding, new seas being formed, uh, huge amounts of erosion, uh, whole areas um, uh, turned into the like the badlands, uh, giant amounts of um, infrastructure damage from that, uh, as well as the high winds and the uh, loss of the um, electrical system, all of these kind of things. So, uh, it's going to be bad. Uh, it's going to be really bad. Now, if if any of this is accurate, uh, could be 100% wrong, don't think so. Uh, could be some percentage wrong, likely. Uh, the percentage totally unknowable at this stage. Uh, so, so, don't trust me on any of this stuff. Go and read the farsight.org thing and read all of their stuff um, read Sean David Morton's book we haven't even gotten into what the real woo woo stuff's going to be like uh, make up your own mind on these kind of things don't don't assume I know what I'm talking about here uh, but uh, the world that's being described a year from now in the confirmatory experiments from and also the backup to the confirmatory experiments also describe that as well as my original data not in any way associated with the Farsight experiments uh, are describing a planet in which we don't have to worry about money because there's no such thing as electronic trading or even electronic communication. And even uh, ham radio is going to be really spotty because of the volcanic activity and the, the huge amounts of crap in the air. But hey, this is a good thing because the huge amounts of crap in the air actually will prevent some level of death because they will have a tendency, like the chemtrails, to filter out a lot of the ultraviolet and the deadly ultraviolet D uh, uh, type won't be able to come on down and fry your butt while you're out uh, trying to find worms to eat. Um, but, uh, you know, it's going to be bad because you're out there trying to find worms to eat. On the other hand... Um, when you're out there trying to find worms to eat, if you come across the entrance to one of these deep underground bunkers, hey, you know, <laughs> figure out some way of locking that thing. Uh, block it off. Because let me tell you, none of the data that we have and none of the stuff in the farsight.org, uh, um, nor our confirmatory experiments, uh, show any kind of rescue, show any s sign that government military or cops are even popping their heads out of the whatever hole they're in. So that's the good news. You don't have to worry about dealing with officialdom if this view is accurate because they're hiding in holes and you're not getting down there and they apparently are not coming out anytime soon. So that's, uh, you know, in my way of thinking, that's not too bad. Uh, at least we don't have to deal with them in the midst of all of this crud. Uh, but you will have to deal with all of this crud. So, uh, I won't go into any of the detail of the confirmatory experiments, but I will tell you that the inland areas are going to get uh, totally devastated, as well as the coast. The inland areas are going to get flooded, curiously, because of the huge amounts of water coming in from the oceans that are going to go up into the air and then come down again. There's even suggestions in our global coastal event that there's new water in the mix in the sense that, you know, maybe some of the incoming meteors or asteroids and or maybe water creation as the planet expands. Um, but the net result is a totally changed coastline and what we can think of as um, uh, f uh, tidal flooding. Now, that's in our global coastal event. So let me stop for a second and discuss three, three things here. Tsunamis, displacement waves, and tidal flooding. A tsunami is an energy wave transmitting itself through the water. That is to say, the wave, the impact, the shock wave moves through the water. The water molecules jostle up and down. They don't really shift much. Uh, the wave moves, and then at the very end of the wave, when the wave runs out of water, it has to do something, so it takes a bunch of the water and it tries to crawl up the land. And that's a tsunami. Tsunamis have a limited height. That's because the gravity causes the wave to crash back upon itself the higher it climbs. So tsunamis are not ever going to get much more than 30 feet high as a rule, and that their outside limit is... Uh, uh, under certain coastal conditions, and, cer and that's another thing, is it, it, the height 
of the tsunami has to do with the uh, steepness and the angle of uh, attack it has to take in reaching, uh, breaching actually the coast. And so the theoretical maximum, I think, is on the order of 120 feet on certain coasts. The practical maximum on the vast majority of coasts is less than 80 feet. Uh, the, the reality is usually 30 to 40 feet maximum. Uh, in terms of what's manifested. So that's a tsunami. It's a wave moving through water. Now, a displacement wave is not a tsunami. A displacement wave is where you throw a big chunk of something into water and you displace big chunks of water molecules. That is to say, those water molecules cannot occupy the space that the big thing now occupies, so they got to move. Whereas before, you were slapping the water and sending the shock wave through in the form of a tsunami. Here, you're actually displacing the water, and it's got to move. So an asteroid produces a displacement wave. And i got to tell you that the same math does not apply to displacement waves that it does to tsunamis. But that's the good news, because a displacement wave has a tendency to burn its energy out a lot quicker than does a tsunami. And it does it in a different manner. If you're close to the displacement wave, well, that's bad for you because the displacement wave can rise a lot higher than the uh, 80-foot practical maximum of a tsunami and the 30 to 40-foot manifested uh, maximums. Uh, Displacement wave can go several hundred feet high. Um, There would be, again, a theoretical maximum in terms of how high the water could actually still exist as water and rise. It it may rise as this foamy stuff that isn't really water, but that's a secondary issue. So anyway, a displacement wave, though, if an asteroid hits in the middle of the Pacific, a displacement wave will be created. If the asteroid's large enough, the displacement wave will be very large and may reach uh, nearby coastlines. But far distant coastlines will not experience that impact the same way that um, nearby coastlines will. So here's, here's, we're going to depart for a second from my actual data to give you a little bit of my understanding of this. It's my thinking that when when and if an asteroid hits in, say, the southern ocean, it would cause a displacement wave that would um, uh, cause damage to Sydney, the way that the Farsight.org descriptor for Sydney has. And you would note that the damage caused to Sydney would be uh, worse if the displacement wave was closer to Sydney than the damage caused to Hawaii uh, because the distance is further and the wave would uh, dissipate a lot of its energy. The displacement wave is the molecules of the water being heaved up and then coming back down. Now, when they heave them up, that will create, if it heaves up a sufficient amount, that will create a vacuum, if you will, that will draw water in from the coast. And in a tsunami-like fashion, the water will retreat into the hole occupied by the object. And then a lot of water will come crashing back down because it has been momentarily suspended into the air. And then it comes crashing back down and forces the water that is is occupying that space to move again. And so that's when you get first the uh, the water being sucked off the coast, and then the water comes crashing back down into the displacement area, and it forces it back up again on the coast. And so you get this sloshing effect. And that's how the displacement of, uh, wave will affect coasts that are not near enough to actually be inundated by the wave itself. This is... Uh, so if we have... Um, an asteroid hit in the southern ocean, south of the equator, up here in the Pacific Northwest, I doubt we'll get much in the way of displacement wave activity. But we'll get very, if it were large enough, we would get what we would think of as a very exceptionally strange tidal activity. Because from our viewpoint, the water would retreat as though it were an, an exceptional tide in an odd time or even at an odd depth, even if it was the regular time. And then the water would come back in, again in an odd fashion. Now, if an asteroid hits and in our global coastal event and so on, even up here in the northwest, it's not going to be ambiguous because there's so many other uh, indicators. Uh, we'll get instant shockwave, or not instant shockwave, but we'll get shockwaves that will travel through the air and through the land, in forming um, um, bow pressure compression waves in the air as well as compression waves in the rock that will result in earthquakes and all kinds of air unsettlement, so to speak, in our local environment environment uh, within a short period of time of any kind of an impact, even in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So we'll know it's an impact. Uh, We may think at the moment that it's an earthquake, but then the arrival of the winds and this kind of thing will confirm that there wasn't indeed some form of an impact or that sort of deal. 
But our, our global coastal event describes, uh, from my viewpoint up here in Pacific Northwest, describes a, a really oddity, which is that Puget Sound seems to drain, uh, even to the point where Seattle is high and dry. We had some indication that uh, San Diego and San Francisco uh, ports would be non-usable. Now, we didn't have any indications for how long they would be non-usable. It might just be minutes. <coughs> I'm just reporting the data that we had. They just showed the, the ports as being dry and non-usable. And then we had a lot of other data about everything being flooded out and how the ports and um, the uh, subsequent uh, uh, local habitation were unusable because of the inrush of the water. Now, here's where it's going to get a little tricky. If you look at the farsight.org stuff, you'll see the descriptions for Fort Jesus, Mombasa, for um, um, Key West, for uh, Hawaii, and for Sydney show lots and lots of damage, buildings destroyed, and so on. We also have that. But because our global coastal event looked at things in a way that they did not, I've got a lot of other cities. And so, for instance, in Finland, Finland will receive the global coastal event as their first ever extraordinarily high tides as well as earthquakes. And then they're going to get bad weather. But they're not going to get flooded out. But Finland doesn't usually have tides to speak of. And here they're, they're not really a tidal nation. As you get further, closer to the poles, tides are less of an issue, in, and especially in some areas. Uh, but Finland is going to have some uh, extraordinarily uh, odd coastal flooding that will be a temporary effect. Uh, we have temporary associated with that. In areas where I'm at, in the Pacific Northwest, and in areas along the California coast, down into Mexico, through Central America, over into the Caribbean, all up and down the East Coast, all over through Europe, Mediterranean, Asia, the flooding effects are not described as temporary. They're described as permanent. They, in fact, create a created a whole new entity class within my model that I called Future Pop for pu- future population in which I describe people that were basically, for generations, four or five generations, subsisting as as coastal scavengers on our current civilization. And that, for instance, my local environment was underwater to the point where people who had GPS maps uh, and could figure out where things were could dive and recover industrial commodities. That appears to be the... Um, the goal of these coastal scavengers is to find things like, uh, uh, you know, copper and uh, resin and all kinds of um, uh, pre-manufactured industrial commodities that they can bring up and dry off and use and or sell or, or trade. There's no selling to speak of. The world in which the global coastal event existed, by the way, is also concurrent with the cube farm escapees from the shadow world Oh, uh, descriptors that it brought up in our work, the space goat farts and the idea of space aliens here on the planet, and how the um, future pop, the uh, coastal scavengers, had to watch out for these bastards and were uh, basically constantly skirmishing with them as the space aliens or interdimensional aliens or whoever the hell these guys are set up their own colonies, I guess, in devastated areas that uh, used to be human habitation. And that was just a weird oddity that, you know, never in my mind when it was uh, coming out did I think that it could ever occur. I thought I was picking up, you know, some screenwriter somewhere or, you know, a great movie that would be a huge hit and everybody would be talking about it. But instead we have a situation where we have um, uh, the Cube Farm shadow guys describing the world pretty much as uh, Sean David Morton does in his Sands of Time. And they're both saying that, hey, there's these rifts and, um, you know, don't look now, but uh, critters are going to be coming through and setting up shop. And so my global coastal event thing also had that in there, along with the future pop. All of which stems from what we're going to be going through uh, five months from now. And that it starts in, it's actually already started. I mean, you know, it started in 1998 when we really started lining up with things. But insofar as the real major activity, the crashing of the economy and all that kind of stuff, it's starting within days And um, uh, they're going to just keep, the powers that be are just going to keep trying to keep everything together. You'll note that they have no plans for anything. There is no plan to repair anything. There's no plan to replace anything. There's no plan to pay off any debt. There's no plan that extends beyond. There's not even a five-year plan. There's not even a one-year plan. These guys' plans are 
Let's just get us through the election. Let's just get us through this election. Let us just get through that far. And, you know, basically, I think that really is all they care about. And once they get to December, they're going to start disappearing in their hidey holes and, we, and uh, lock the doors behind them, and they just won't care about us. And they're gonna, we're going to be wandering around saying, okay, where did all the politicians go, you know? Where's all the people from CNN? Where are all these media bastards? You know, where are all the Bohemian Grove guys? Now, they're going to leave up here all of the traitors and the um, uh, the banksters and the corporate guys. A lot of those people don't have tickets to the uh, the save, um, uh, save your ass under the, the earth uh, scenario. And so there will be a lot of people that will be left up here. Uh, I suspect a lot of them will start spilling their guts come December when they start freaking out and realize that they are left up here. And they sort of knew what was going on, and they thought they had a ticket, and they don't. So we can expect all kinds of uh, interesting activity then, much of which has been described in our reports. Also, uh, all kinds of information about us, uh, you know, regular humans going and looking in the Vatican Library and, you know, looting these uh, uh, library stashes that the government has, this kind of thing. Uh, So very interesting um, descriptors for what we're going to be getting into in the way of the world. And apparently, according to the confirmatory experiments we've just done, or in the process of doing, because they're not quite complete with the one set, um, uh, the Farsight.org guys were fairly accurate, and that's a subset of a larger, uh, in terms of my thinking, uh, our global uh, coastal event descriptors, they all point to the same damn thing. And then we got the powers that be out there doing this kind of stuff. So I'm going to sign off here and get some food and then going out and work on my boat, um, figure out what I'm going to do. I'm only 105 feet off sea level. Uh, that's not going to be good. And I'm going to have to make some changes in where I'm at relative to this. And I would suggest that uh, if you have uh, the wherewithal, um, you know, the woo-woo guys, uh, Courtney Brown and... Um, uh, Sean David Morton, even ourselves, I'm, none of us have any income here. The, the whole, uh, economy has hit us really hard, as well as everybody else, of course, but, you know, we never did have jobs, so to speak. And so, uh, you know, buy their books, buy their, um, DVDs, uh, uh especially with Courtney Brown. We gotta get him some money here. He's got a really good idea for, uh, rebuilding afterwards and uh, giving us all a leg up on the evil, dirty, rotten, nasty bastards and their holes in the ground. And I think it ought to be supported. So if you're, especially if you're a wild ass crazy millionaire and you got some dollars hanging around, uh, go talk to Courtney. He's got a really good way to use them. So, um, I guess that's pretty much it. Let me check my notes real quick here. Yeah, I think that's it. This is the second time I've done it. This is the much better version of it. Uh, but I'm getting kind of tired at the moment, uh, especially after talking so many hours with uh, Courtney. And I got a few more phone calls to make today. But I'm going to sign off now. You can send us, uh, send me email. Uh, please check out the stuff at farsight.org. I give credence to it. Uh, you needn't. Uh, but if you're going to dispute me on it, at least you'd better read it. And uh, there's no disputing. (laughs) Powers that be are acting really weird. Of course, we'll know uh, just how weird things are going to get when when and if they pull their false flag at the Olympics. If they go ahead and do that, they'll also let the Israelis loose on the Iranians. Uh, And they'll do it because the end of the world is here and they just don't give a shit anymore. And they're just going to kind of like work out some of their issues. Uh, But at the same time, that gives us a whole lot of freedom. It'll tell you for sure that, you know this ver- vision of the world for next year is accurate, then if that's the case, hey, you know, if I were working at a gas station or something or, you know, working for Walmart or this kind of thing and I had any kind of wherewithal in terms of, you know, a good pair of boots and a backpack or something, I might just say, hmm, I quit, get myself a good book on, you know, uh, how to live in the wilderness and start hiking. I don't know, you know, uh, my situation, I'm a care provider, so I've got people to watch out for and I've got things I've got to do. And I have yet to decide how I'm going to react to a lot of this. Uh, I do know that, you know, it ain't business as usual anymore. And uh, a whole lot of freedom in that. Somewhat sanguine with it. Uh, Anyway, guys, sorry. Won't take up any more of your time with my weird ramblings. Uh, Please go look at farsight.org. And if you have the wherewithal and you're interested in the woo-woo component and how we're going to deal with the interdimensional space aliens, uh, you can get a vision of that through the Sean David Morton book. And also the Courtney Brown's interviews with uh, Red Ice, 
Radio and uh, Carrie Cassidy at uh, Project Camelot. Check them out. They're really good. Thanks. <laughs>